Hello everyone, welcome to Let's Learn Physics. Join me as I reread my physics textbooks, catching up on what I used to know and what I missed out on in grad school, and explaining it to curious minds like you. Last time, we looked at how to describe physical systems with descripted variables and their weighted rate of change, or coordinates and momenta. Together, these coordinates and momenta are called canonical coordinates, and they make up a system's phase space. A system's Hamiltonian is a function of its canonical coordinates, and it's usually the total energy, kinetic plus potential. If we shift a coordinate, it changes the Hamiltonian. Because energy is conserved, we must also change the momentum to keep the value of the Hamiltonian constant. The same is true the other way. If we shift the momentum, we must also shift the position to keep the Hamiltonian constant. These are the Hamilton equations of motion, and they show us how a system changes over time on a path through its phase space. Theoretically, if you knew a system's coordinates and momenta to infinite precision, you could calculate its past and future motion to the ends of time. If we apply this to every particle in the universe, then we can conclude that, at least according to classical physics, the entire universe is deterministic. Today, we're going into chapter nine of classical mechanics by Goldstein and collaborators, to learn a new tool called a Poisson bracket that will help us better understand how Hamiltonian physics predicts the future and give us insight into other aspects of physical existence. In the past, we've gone through each chapter section by section, talking about each topic in the order the book talks about it. However, from here on out, the book gets extremely math heavy, so we're going to do it differently from now on. I've decided to change my approach and rearrange the ideas to tell a conceptual story that you can follow along with without getting too hung up on the math. This material was all new to me and I wanted to make sure I really understood it before making this video. Furthermore, I actually got halfway through editing this video before realizing I had completely missed the point and I had to scrap everything and start over from scratch. Special thanks to Leonard Susskind's lectures on YouTube for helping me to understand. And if I get anything wrong or leave out anything important, please let me know in the comments. To me, quality is much more important than getting videos out quickly, so thanks for your patience. So what is a Poisson bracket and how can it help us understand physical problems? Let's find out by using the Hamiltonian method on the harmonic oscillator. The simplest type of harmonic oscillator is a mass bouncing back and forth on a spring without friction. Because the strength of the spring does not change over time, the Hamiltonian is just kinetic energy plus potential energy. In college physics, we write kinetic energy in terms of velocity. In Hamiltonian physics, we substitute in the momentum. The equations of motion show us how x, the position, and p, the momentum, change over time. Here, I'll write out the derivatives just so you can follow along if you want to. And we can construct the phase space from the solutions. Remember, in this graph, we're only looking at the horizontal position and how fast we're moving horizontally. The higher above the horizontal axis, the faster we're moving to the right, and the lower below the horizontal axis, the faster we're moving to the left. If we find ourselves at a particular point, the arrow at that point tells us how our position and momentum are changing at that moment and where we'll move to next. By following the arrows, we can see the exact path we will take in the future and how we got here from the past. And the only difference between each path is the total energy. But what if we wanted to know how something else changes with time, like the force in the spring? The rate of change of anything is its total derivative with respect to time. Expanding it out with the chain rule from calculus, we get this. This term on the end is how the strength of the spring itself is changing over time, and in our example, that's zero, so we get rid of it. Remember from the first episode of this series, we write the derivative of a variable with respect to time, its rate of change, as that variable with a dot on top. x is our position variable. In general, position variables are written as q. This could represent not only left, right, up, down, forward, backward, but maybe angle, maybe frequency, any number of things. Just in this particular example, it happens to be x. Now, where else have we seen q dot and p dot? The Hamilton equations of motion. So let's substitute the other side of those equations into this equation. Now you might think, why are we doing that? It looks more complicated, not less. But you might notice that these two terms are anti-symmetric. 
The only difference between them is we switch the Q and the P in the denominator. If we label this as curly bracket FH, we call it the Poisson bracket of the force with the Hamiltonian. So now we have a simple looking equation that shows us how the force is changing over time. Great, we've solved the problem. Okay, it looks like we're just covering up advanced calculus with fewer symbols. Does the Poisson bracket actually help us? We're in luck. Because these brackets come from calculus, they obey certain rules. If you know calculus, you can derive these rules, but I'll just state them here. One, the bracket of two functions is equal to the negative bracket of the two functions switched around. Two, if either of the functions is multiplied by a scalar, we can pull that scalar out of the brackets. Three, if one side of the bracket is two functions multiplied together, we can use the product rule from calculus. Four, if one side of the brackets is two functions added or subtracted, we can change it to two brackets added or subtracted. Five, and pay attention to this one, the Poisson bracket of two coordinates with each other is zero. The Poisson bracket of two momenta with each other is zero. And the Poisson bracket of a coordinate and a momentum is the Kronecker delta. That means it's one if they're conjugate to each other and zero if they're unpaired. Six, the Poisson bracket of anything with itself is zero. Seven, the Poisson bracket of two functions of just position is zero, and the Poisson bracket of two functions of just momentum is zero. Eight, this thing of cyclic functions, called Jacobi's identity, is true. Furthermore, they do not depend on which coordinates we use as a basis, that is, which coordinates we take the derivatives with respect to. The Poisson brackets with one set of coordinates is equal to the Poisson bracket in a different set of coordinates. This means Poisson brackets represent objective physical facts. They're not relative. And here's the thing. By using these rules, we can turn advanced physics problems into algebra problems, completely ignoring the fact that there's calculus underneath. Let's look at rule number five again. This is where the magic happens that turns calculus into algebra. This shows us what happens if we poissonate, not a technical term, coordinates with each other. If we have two Q's poissonated together, we get zero. If we have two P's poissonated together, we get zero. If we have a Q and a P poissonated, we get a Kronecker delta. For example, that means if we take the bracket of X with PX, we get one. But if we take the bracket of X with PY, we get zero. Now let's see what these rules can do by using them on the spring force with the harmonic oscillator. We start by writing the force in Hamiltonian inside the Poisson brackets in terms of Q and P. Remember, Q is just X, but I'm writing it as Q to be more general. By rule four, we can split this into two brackets. By rule seven, the second term is zero. By rule two, we can pull out all the constants. By rule three, we can reduce it to brackets of QP, combine like terms, and cancel the two. And by rule five, we know the remaining Poisson bracket is one. So here is how the force changes over time in terms of momentum. Notice that even though the Poisson brackets are built out of advanced calculus, we didn't have to take a single derivative. We just followed the rules and the answer fell out. Let's check our answer. We know force equals mass times acceleration. We know momentum equals mass times velocity. Substitute those in and do a little algebra, and we get this. Take the antiderivative of both sides, and we get the familiar equation of motion of the harmonic oscillator. You may have noticed that the only thing in the Poisson bracket directly related to physics is the fact that we used a Hamiltonian. Everything else is pure math. We put the functions for f and h in later. Furthermore, because we didn't evaluate any derivatives, we didn't choose a coordinate basis. Therefore, this equation tells you how any property of a classical physical system changes over time regardless of coordinates. That's powerful. From now on, I'll use lowercase f to mean any function, not just force. Putting the Hamiltonian in the second slot of the Poisson bracket gives us the rate of change of the function in the first slot over time. Thus, we call the Hamiltonian the generator of the system motion through time. But what if we put something else in the second slot? Can we generate other rates of change? Indeed, we can. 
The most common is to use momentum to generate how a function changes with position. But in fact, any function of the canonical coordinates generates a function's rate of change with respect to something. And this leads us to a profound feature of physics. Suppose a function's Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian is zero. That means the function's rate of change over time is zero. It doesn't change. It's conserved. Rule one tells us if we switch the order of the items in the Poisson bracket, we also get zero. This seems trivial, right? If we subtract two things and get zero, then if we subtract them the other way and get zero, there's no surprise. However, if we look at this with the generator interpretation, it's incredibly profound. This bracket tells us that if we change the coordinates in the way that this function generates, the Hamiltonian doesn't change. That means the energy remains the same as we slide along this coordinate. In other words, the Hamiltonian is invariant. The system is symmetric under this transformation. In conclusion, where there is a conserved quantity, there's a continuous symmetry. And where there's a continuous symmetry, there's a conserved quantity. This is Nuther's theorem, named after Emmy Nuther, one of the few women to make the history books in early modern physics. Let's take a look at some of these symmetries. Momentum generates a change in position. If the Hamiltonian is symmetric under changes in position, the momentum is conserved. Angular momentum generates changes in angle. If the Hamiltonian is invariant under changes of angle, angular momentum is conserved. If the system is symmetric across time, meaning all else equal, it doesn't matter when the motion starts, energy is conserved. A key point here is that the symmetry must be continuous. We could imagine a series of hills in the shape of a sine wave and say, hey, the motion is the same if we start here or if we start here, therefore momentum is conserved. Not so, because if we start anywhere between those two points, the motion is different. Something is conserved, but it's not momentum. The motion has to be symmetric along the entire path for the momentum to be conserved in that region. There's one more application of Poisson brackets to look at before we end this video to test whether sets of canonical coordinates are valid. Remember, canonical coordinates are generalized versions of position and momentum. They're orthonormal, which means they can be changed individually without affecting the others. For those of you who like a little more math terminology, they are orthonormal basis vectors in phase space. Any valid set of canonical coordinates obeys rule five. For any physical system, be it in space, electrical circuits, fluids, if you have quantities that obey these Poisson brackets, you can use them as canonical coordinates. A surprising consequence of this concerns angular momentum. You might think we can use the x component, y component, and z component of angular momentum as a coordinate basis for rotations. But if we test them with Poisson brackets, they fail rule 5. They don't work as canonical coordinates. But any angular momentum component with the total angular momentum does. This has important consequences in quantum physics. Today we learned a powerful tool for analyzing physical systems in the Hamiltonian framework. Starting from the Hamilton equations of motion, we learned how we can use Poisson brackets to determine how physical quantities change over time. We learned to use the algebra of Poisson brackets, the eight rules, to drastically simplify what would otherwise require complex calculus. We learned that Poisson brackets do not depend on their coordinate basis, which means they represent objective physical facts that are not relative. We called the Hamiltonian the generator of the system motion through time, and the momenta the generator of the motion through its coordinates. We noted how Poisson brackets with the Hamiltonian can be reversed, thus connecting symmetries with conserved quantities. We learned how to use Poisson brackets to test whether sets of canonical coordinates are valid, and that the components of angular momentum fail the test. Next time, we'll go into chapter 10 and learn about action angle variables, a special tool for analyzing periodic motion. As a final note, you might have noticed a long stretch of time between last video and this one. There are multiple reasons for this, but the most important one is I wanted to make sure I understood the material well enough to make a high quality educational video. I actually wrote the whole script filmed it, and edited half of it before realizing it wouldn't work, so I scrapped everything and restarted again from scratch. 
The YouTube algorithm incentivizes creators to put up content rapidly, no matter how half-baked. But I've discovered that for me, quality is far more important than views and subscribers. So thank you for watching. Let me know if it was insightful or if you have any questions in the comments. Subscribe and hit the bell if you'd like to be notified when future videos come out. And if you happen to have extra cash lying around and you think this series is valuable, consider supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.